Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this lecture entitled The Prophecy of Daniel Proves the Bible True. In Isaiah's prophecy, chapter 46, we have the words we've put up on the screen, I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And God here shows that he exists by telling the end from the beginning, by predicting the future, as well as describing the past. Furthermore, in Amos, he says that he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets, not only then declaring the end from the beginning, but revealing this to us through his prophets. So we might summarise then what those two verses say as follows. The Bible has described historical events before they happened, and the point of this is that they, it can therefore be trusted to describe future events before they happen. The point of this lecture is that prophecy is a solid reason for trusting the Bible. The Bible tells us about events that will happen hundreds of years in the future, and we'll see that from Daniel chapter 2 in a few moments. And this, I believe, shows us that the Bible has a supernatural origin. Well, this evening we're thinking, as I say, about Daniel chapter 2, and specifically about King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, I've already said that the Bible describes historical events, and we can read about Nebuchadnezzar because he was an historical character. This image we have here on the screen is an engraving of the likeness of Nebuchadnezzar, or technically Nebuchadnezzar II, as it says there, King of Babylon, 605 to 562 BC. If you go to the British Museum, you can see a lot of evidence for yourself, or if you go to their website and search for Nebuchadnezzar, you can find a lot of evidence that he did actually exist. This is uh, a couple of quotations from the British Museum website about Nebuchadnezzar. It reads as follows. Nebuchadnezzar II, or Nabu Kuduri Usa, which means, O Nabu, protect the sun, came to the throne in 604 BC on the death of his father, Nabu He was succeeded by his son, Amel Mardul, or the biblical character, Evil Merodach, in 562 BC. So those are words straight from the British Museum website and I think they sound convincing um, as far as the British Museum is concerned that Nebuchadnezzar existed. This item is in the British Museum um, in room 55 in the Mesopotamia section. It's entitled The Cylinder of Nebuchadnezzar II and again this image is on the British Museum website if you want to have a look at it for yourself. What they say about it is as follows. This clay cylinder was found in the ruins of the city of Babylon. The cuneiform text describes the three palaces which Nebuchadnezzar II built for himself in Babylon. The first palace was a rebuilding of the palace used by his father Nebuchadnezzar, which Nebuchadnezzar says had become dilapidated. When he had finished, he decided that it was not grand enough so he built himself a new palace on the northern edge of Babylon. This palace had a blue parapet and was surrounded by massive fortification walls. So there is just a, a little example of something from the British Museum that they believe is solid evidence that Nebuchadnezzar, as described in Daniel chapter 2, existed. So, Nebuchadnezzar existed as a character. What of the dream that he dreamt? Let me read to you again verses 31 to 34 of Daniel chapter 2. Thou, O king, sawest, this is Daniel speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, and behold, a great image, this great image whose brightness and was, was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron, 
and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon the feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Now this is a 15th century French illustration of Nebuchadnezzar's dream uh, that we can use to show the different uh, metals that were in this dream. So what did we just read there? We read that the head of the image was of gold. Then we read that the breast and the arms were of silver. The belly and thighs were made of brass and the legs were made of iron, and finally, that the feet were made of iron and clay. And finally, of course, that a stone destroyed the image, shown in this picture, as we see, between the image's legs. The question is, what does this all mean? Well, actually, we're told how to interpret it, and typically the Bible does tell us how to interpret symbology. Sometimes we have to go and look somewhere else for the keys for interpretation. But if we look at verse 37 here, or in fact verses 37 to 41, I'll read those to you. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory, and wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all, Thou art this head of gold, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron. The kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. So we read there that Nebuchadnezzar, or Babylon, was that golden kingdom, that head of gold of the image. And I've put the dates against these simply for um, two help us understand when these uh, empires ruled. Dates are always slightly approximate because it depends on the historian's opinion of what events constitute the beginning and the end of an empire. This kingdom of Babylon, this golden head, was to be replaced by another kingdom of lower value, of silver. Uh, we're not told here who the silver kingdom is, but we know that Babylon was defeated by Cyrus the Great of Persia in 539 BC, and that the Medes and the Persians together ruled over the territory that Babylon had had before. And this is very appropriate because the image has two arms, and here the Medes and the Persians uh, are two aspects of the same historical empire. It's an historical fact as well that the Medes and the Persians, uh, under King Darius III, were defeated by Alexander the Great in 331 BC on behalf of Greece. And whilst the Greeks were uh, themselves replaced in 63 BC by the Romans, again it's interesting that as with the Medes and the Persians, the Roman Empire had two aspects, an eastern and a western part that developed, and eventually two capitals with Rome in the west and Constantinople in the east. Now, the, the western side of the empire, the western leg, if you like, lasted until 455 BC approximately, while the eastern leg carried on another thousand years till about 1450 or so. Now, if we look at a map of the extent of the Roman Empire, we can see here both the western and the eastern aspects of the empire displayed there um, across the territories of uh, Europe and the Middle East and North Africa. This is an image produced uh, shortly before the western side of the empire finally fell. It's interesting actually that the land area is approximately equal here, it appears, between the two sides. So um, we, 
I'm, I'm not clear at the moment as to whether the length of the legs is proportionate to the um, to the number of years they lasted or whether it's more to do with the, the land area, but that, that's just a suggestion here. But I have another suggestion for you that although we've already seen that the Roman Empire lasted uh, in the West until 455 BC approximately, there was another entity with a similar name that claimed to succeed from the Roman Empire called the Holy Roman Empire that lasted from about 962 to 1806 when it was finished off by Napoleon. The most famous monarch of the Holy Roman Empire perhaps being Charlemagne, who was officially given his title by the Pope, which is interesting in itself. And here are two maps comparing the Roman Empire, as we've just seen, with the Holy Roman Empire. And we can see that the Holy Roman Empire didn't have anything like the extent of territory that the Roman Empire did. It's essentially just covering the middle of Europe. But there's still a relationship between the two, which is obviously the, uh, the basis of calling it the Holy Roman Empire. What I'm suggesting here is that although the Roman Empire ended in 455, it was actually alive in spirit until just after 1800, which, if we consider the two sides of the Roman Empire, it helps to rebalance the, the, the dates that the empire occupied, uh, about a 300 year difference in the end between the two sides. <coughs> the eastern side ending in 1500 or so and the western side in 1800 or so. We've not looked at the feet yet and of the image and what they represent, but before we do that I'd like to look for a moment at when Daniel uh, chapter 2 was written, because we need to know whether we're dealing here with prophecy or history, and clearly I believe it's prophecy, but I, I want to just uh, explain why I believe that's the case. <coughs> According to the Bible, of course, Daniel was written around the time of Nebuchadnezzar, which makes it about the 6th century BC. Now, traditionally scholars, well, scholars who don't accept that the Bible is the word of God, of course, have argued that Daniel was written in the 2nd century BC. That creates a problem straight away from a biblical point of view, because then it isn't the word of God anymore, of course. But there's been, <coughs> excuse me, there's been some analysis done more recently of the language of Daniel, and it seems that it is actually much more compatible with a 6th century BC date, which is very interesting, and we might say remarkable, although of course, as, Bible, as a Bible student, I wouldn't say it was remarkable at all, because this is the word of God we're dealing with. Let's suppose for a moment, though, that the, the late date of the 2nd century is actually correct, how much difference does that make to an understanding of this prophecy? Well, it would mean the prophecy was written during the Greek Empire, but still before the Roman, with the characteristic two legs of the Roman Empire. So it would still be a remarkable prophecy, even with such a late date. And as we've already seen, the Roman Empire continued for hundreds of years, both literally and in spirit, into the future. So a late date doesn't take away from that aspect of the prophecy. However, it would mean that the biblical account of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar wasn't historically accurate, and essentially that would mean that this wasn't reliable anymore as the word of God. Okay, we've shown three things so far. Nebuchadnezzar's image is about the empires that would succeed him that Daniel's prophecy was written when the Bible says it was, I believe, in about 600 or so BC. And that the book of Daniel certainly, as we say, could have been written uh, in the 6th century BC, and in fact that in order for this to be part of the word of God, it's required that it, that it was. Okay, well we didn't finish working our way through the image, did we? We got to the legs of iron, the Roman Empire, the Eastern and Western aspects, and the subsequent Holy Roman Empire. <coughs> what followed next? In Daniel chapter 2, verse 33, we read, His legs were of iron, his feet were part of iron, and part of clay. What does this mean when it says that the feet were part of iron and part of clay? What are the feet even talking about? 
Well, as we found with the kingdoms, we're told how to understand this, and this is in verse 41. Verses 41 and 42 read as follows. Whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, forasmuch as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. We're told explicitly there in verse 42 that the kingdom represented by the feet will be, as it says, partly strong and partly broken. So it's a kingdom having the strength of the iron along with the weakness of the clay. We've already seen that the Roman Empire and the subsequent Holy Roman Empire extended to only a few hundred years ago, in fact. But these empires are gone. The question is, have they been replaced by another empire? Well, let's take another look at the territory of Babylon. This map shows the territory of the Babylonian Empire. And it extends right past Babylon and actually covers a lot of biblically significant territory. Now, it would be fair to say that the countries now occupying these areas covered by the Babylonian Empire are a mixture of strong and weak nations. But actually that isn't exactly what the text says because you see the bit in red there. It's the strength of the iron that it's very specifically highlighting is to be an attribute of this uh, empire of the feet. We're being told that some of the nations in the toes and in the feet will be like the iron or the Roman Empire, and that some won't. It's also worth bearing in mind that the territories of the empires we're thinking about this evening seem to increase with each takeover, while conversely their splendour decreases as we see the value of the metals decreasing, working down the image. So Babylon, symbolised by gold, was the most royal of the empires. Whereas by the time we get to Rome, via Greece, we have empires that mix the autocratic qualities of a, a royalty with a form of government that's um, democracy by the people. And essentially it, it becomes administrative rather than kingly. Well, let's remind ourselves how much territory Rome controlled. This map shows the largest extent occupied um, by the... Um, um, by the Roman um, Empire and crucially uh, it covers Babylon itself over, um, if I can just point um, where are we? over uh, this area over here modern day Iraq of course the green area on the map indicates the generally agreed territories occupied by Rome and the other colours indicate disputed ones I've made a couple of hints about what I believe the feet of the image are describing. So I'd like to go and just review the evidence I've suggested so far. The feet are characteristically Roman, strong as the Bible has it in some parts and not in others. So we need to look for a kingdom that's made up of strong and weak nations, but where the strength has an essentially Roman character. Remember that emphasis of scripture, that it's the strength of the iron. We also suggest that the feet are of a less regal character than even the Roman Empire, with the clay mixed with iron makes it of even less monetary value. And this suggests, I believe, rather than a kingly empire as the Babylonian Empire, it suggests quite the opposite. Yes, autocratic, but essentially an administrative empire. And thirdly, we'd suggest that it will likely occupy an even greater territory than the Roman Empire occupied. Let's take a look at that last point first. That, so this is the area occupied, as we said earlier, by the Roman Empire at its maximum extent. 
This second map is interesting because it's a map of the countries of the present European Union. And I've put it alongside at a roughly the same scale, so we can see that although it doesn't cover the southern and eastern aspects of the Roman Empire, it does very definitely cover the northern aspects very well indeed. What were our other two points there? Let's take the second one next. That it would be essentially a, a less royal empire than even the Roman, that it would be administrative in character. We know that the Roman Empire had an emperor, so not a king like Babylon, but still somebody of status and importance. These chaps are three of the four European Union presidents. There are different institutions in Europe, and each of them has its own president. And what did we say about the empire we're looking for being essentially administrative? When we think about the European Union, I'd suggest that is one of its primary characteristics. The last point we made, uh, or rather the first point on this list, is that it would be characteristically Roman. Now, in, in the case of the European Union, besides the territory it currently occupies, I'd like to suggest three other ways in which the European Union is Roman in character. The first point to make is from when it was originally set up. This photograph is of the signing of the Treaty of Rome. This wasn't the first treaty of Europe, but it was the most prominent, signed in 1957, um, and it brought into being the uh, EEC, which then became the <coughs> European Union. So that treaty, as we say, is the Treaty of Rome, and this is re regarded as the primary founding treaty of the EU, or the EEC as it was. The second point I'd like to make is regarding the legal systems of the countries involved in Europe. Very broadly speaking, there are two kinds of legal system in Europe. The one we have in this country, our own national laws, is termed a common law legal system. And what that essentially means is that law is based on precedent set by judges rather when they interpret the will of Parliament, rather than uh, necessarily the laid, laid down rules by the, uh, by the government. Now the other system of law that's prevalent in the European Union is civil law. Uh, the difference here, as you probably guess, is that the authorities are more prescriptive. And this is really why there's a clash in the, Euro in the UK between our legal traditions and Europe's legal traditions, that theirs are more prescriptive. But not only does European-style law have an authoritative air to it, it has another name, and it's a name that refers to its origins. It gets called, or is referred to as, Roman law. There's more, though. Some European Union countries use common law, the first type we met with that's on that list there. England, Wales, Northern Ireland do. Scotland, interestingly, doesn't. But the, the UK and uh, Ireland aside, what do other European Union countries use? Well, this is a map of the different kinds of uh, legal code in use in Europe. And the different colours mean different things. Now, we'll ignore the UK and Ireland. Uh, we'll ignore Russia as well, which is showing up in lilac on the far right of the map. All of the other colours, though, mean one thing. They mean civil law or as we said before, Roman law. So the vast majority of countries in the European Union and outside of it um, maybe as well with the, the very northern European countries, um, all of these countries are civil law, Roman law countries. And I think that's very interesting. And these countries of the EU are the countries you saw earlier on the map of the European Union occupying the northern part of the Roman Empire. We said there was a third way in which the European Union is characteristically Roman, and that's in terms of religion. Not in the sense that the EU uses the classical gods of mythology, um, although there is a bit of that as well, but more because of the Roman Catholic nature of Europe. This map here shows the um, countries in red where Roman Catholicism is the majority religion. 
and essentially that's covering much of the countries of the European Union. Remember what we said that the, there would be the strong Roman aspects of the Kingdom of the Feet and the weak clay-like aspects as well. Now, just on the matter of Roman Catholicism, we don't have time to look at Roman Catholicism this evening and particularly its place in prophecy, but it does have a very significant place in Bible prophecy. Uh, and I will say as, a, as an introduction to a, uh, subsequent talks I'm sure we'll have on this, that it's not in a good way. So let's summarise those points then we, uh, we are looking for in this empire of the feet of the image. Firstly, we said that the feet would be characteristically Roman. And we suggest that the Treaty of Rome and the Roman legal system and the Roman Catholic faith are all um, aspects of the Roman character of the European Union. We've seen that the European Union is looked after by several presidents and that it's essentially an administrative democracy. We'd suggest that's a yes to the second point then. The third point is interesting. The European Union does cover a lot of land, but it currently only occupies really the northern aspect of the Roman Empire. But I think we can see that this may change. In 2014, there is the fourth European Union Africa Summit in Brussels. I was looking on the European Commission website and I found uh, some information about European Union energy research of all things. And they had a map, which I'm going to show you, of the Mediterranean partner countries as they describe them. And they're the ones highlighted there in green. Now at the bottom there you've got a list of those countries. Egypt, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, Palestine, Syria, Tunisia and Turkey. Well this is the um, part of the eastern aspect of the Roman Empire and also the southern aspect of the western side. What we have here is a collection of, um, some of them are weak and disadvantaged nations, which seems to correspond with the clay of the image's feet, because they're, many of these are not like the European Union nations, the strong aspects of this European Union empire. We don't know that these countries will align themselves with the European Union, but I'd certainly suggest that we can see the seeds of that happening. So we can anticipate, as I suggest, further developments. OK, well, finally we need to think about the stone that demolished the image. Going from Daniel chapter 2 again, verses 34 and 35, we read that the stone that he saw was um, cut out without hands. And continuing to read, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, which filled the whole earth. Now, what does this mean? Well, more specifically, what does the stone represent? We've seen that the metals of the image indicate kingdoms, and <coughs> verse 44 shows us that the same thing is true of the stone. Reading what it says on the screen, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, speaking of the rest of the image, and it shall stand forever. So we're being told that the stone is a kingdom, but not a human one. It will be, in fact, the kingdom of God, the re-establishment of the kingdom of David and Solomon of the Old Testament, with Christ ruling it from Jerusalem. This kingdom was taken away from Israel because of their wickedness, ultimately by the Romans in AD 70 when they sacked Jerusalem. But contrary to what some people believe, it is that kingdom of Israel that will be restored and established as the eternal kingdom of God 
and not the church. This verse from Ezekiel chapter 21, and it's verses 25 to 27, describes precisely what we've just said about the overturning of Israel. I'll read the words to you. And thou profane wicked prince of Israel, whose day is come, when iniquity shall have an end, thus saith the Lord God, remove the diadem and take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more, until he come whose right it is, and I will give it him. Now, whilst Israel is currently a nation, it isn't the kingdom of God. So, in one sense, there is a restoration, but it's not the restoration under God's appointed representative that this speaks of, the one to whom God will give the kingdom. Why does the Bible use a stone to represent the kingdom anyway? And why does it say that the stone was cut out without hands? Other scriptures provide an answer to this. In the Old Testament, God is described himself as a rock. Here are two verses from 2nd of Samuel chapter 23. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spake to me. He that ruleth over men must be just ruling in the fear of God. And he shall be as the light of the morning when the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springeth out of the earth by clear shining after rain. And notice what else those verses say. I've highlighted that there. He that ruleth over men must be just, and that he shall be as the light of the morning. This is describing God's appointed representative who would take over the kingdom. That individual is described elsewhere as a stone in scripture. This is Jesus, of course, speaking of himself. He says as follows in Matthew chapter 21. Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvellous in our eyes. The Lord Jesus here applies Old Testament prophecy to himself, which he is entitled to do as it was written about him in advance. He was born of a virgin, hence the strange expression, cut out without hands. He was not the product of human intervention, but divine. His own people, 2,000 years ago, rejected him and had him crucified, as it says there, the stone which the builders rejected. And yet, God raised him from the dead, and he currently waits in heaven preparing to return when God tells him to. We see this in these words from an angel that was present at his ascension, reading from Acts chapter 1, verse 11. And while they, that is the disciples, looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner, as ye have seen him go into <coughs> heaven. When Jesus returns, he will re-establish the kingdom of God in Jerusalem. Actually, the entire image of Nebuchadnezzar's dream is now standing. It has its feet the mixed, weak and strong nations of the European Union. And other Bible prophecies tell us that Israel needs to be a nation in the land at the time of Christ's return, and also that they will be invaded by an international confederacy before he returns. Israel does exist in the land, as we've said, after 2,000 years of not being there. And various nations, for various reasons, would like to take away Israel from being a nation. What we've seen tonight is only a fraction of the detail of just one chapter. The Bible also has several other complementary prophecies about the political and the religious events of our time. I suggest that if you want to know more or if you want to discuss anything 
else to do with the Bible that you come talk to me or to Kevin maybe or to any Christadelphian here this evening about this uh, after this lecture because of course next week it may be too late. Thank you very much for listening.